Good Monday morning, everyone. Everyone who has ever even tried to uh, start to study the works of Aleister Crowley almost immediately uh, run into references to the equinox. And uh, which is sort of frustrating uh, because almost every other uh, footnote in, in Crowley's material is say C Equinox Volume 1 number 5 or C Equinox Number 1 uh, Volume or Volume 1 number so and so. Later on in life there's references to Equinox Volume 3. Uh, Mysteriously, there doesn't seem to be an Equinox Volume 4, but there's uh, numerous numbers within each of those uh, sets of the Equinox. Now, the Equinox started out as sort of an, uh, a magazine on steroids, a hardcover magazine that came out every six months. And uh, it was full of uh, uh, Crowley's fantastic AA material, but includes material by other people, including uh, uh, Captain Fuller and uh, uh, poetry by uh, Aleister Crowley under various names and things like that. Uh, and it was a 10 numbered set, Equinox Volume 1. And uh, Obviously, uh, it was out of print for many years, and uh, then in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the good folks at Weiser uh, reproduced uh, the 10 numbered set of, of the Equinox in several editions. And uh, truly was par partially responsible for the uh, occult and esoteric revival of the of the second half of the 20th century. Um, but obviously it's a very expensive uh, uh, set. And uh, so uh, later on, around 1975 or so, uh, uh, both Weiser and uh, Llewellyn published what they uh, uh, called uh, the Gems of the Equinox. Uh, which uh, was uh, compiled um, and uh, I guess we would have to say edited, but actually curated uh, by Israel Regardi. Uh, that's the first closest thing to the equinox I first got was the, the early first uh, Llewellyn edition of Gems from the Equinox. I remember when I bought it. Uh, it was at uh, the the Profit Bookstore at Porcicall in San Pedro, and uh, there wasn't any Crowley material there at all at that at the time, and, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, but they had Gems of the Equinox, and it was much more money than I could afford. I was very, I was like twenty six or twenty seven or something like that, and. Uh, when I took it up to the counter, the woman at the counter says, Oh, you like Crowley, huh? And uh, I had a couple of Crowley uh, books that a friend brought back from England, so I was familiar with enough with him to know that I just loved the guy. And I said, Oh, yeah, I love that old beast. And she said, uh, she said, uh, well, if you like killing babies. And I said, he didn't kill any babies. Yes, he did. He did on that island. And uh, so I knew she was probably thinking about, the, uh, you know, Chefalu, the Abbey of the Lima and all of the the infamous Abbey of Thelema in Chefalu's Sicily. And I said, you mean Sicily? No, that island off of, off of Italy. 
And, and I'm thinking, look, I'm getting ready to, to, you know, give her like 30 bucks of my hard earned or hard scraped up uh, uh, money here. And she's insulting me both as a client and as, uh, as a human. And, uh, but I knew after she said uh, that it, it was an island off of, off of Italy that it wasn't Sicily. <laughs> I knew that it was going to be no good. She's probably going to be uh, uh, not worth it. But anyway, I took that home. And it was, it was good. It was a lot of, uh, of the important magical material from the Equinox was in it. But, but other things that reviews and, and other things that weren't particularly magically uh, uh, related. Well, years and years and years have, of course, passed. And it wasn't too, uh, too awfully long ago when my good friends at Weiser, Mike Conlon and, and uh, my good uh, uh, friends and supporters at Weiser asked me to curate and uh, uh, edit and introduce uh, what they a, a small series of uh, affordable uh, texts that they called the best of the equinox, and uh, uh, I was happy to do it. I was honored to do it, and we uh, it brought it out in just three volumes, okay? And I've, uh, volume one was the Enochian magic material from the equinox. And number two was the dramatic ritual. And I read from this uh, as uh, we were talking about the, the rites of Eleusis just this last week sometime. And the third one, provocatively enough, is sex magic, okay? And uh, today, I'm going to uh, read my very brief introduction to this sex magic one, with your permission. Oh, I'll, of course, the publisher is wiser. And these are available in these beautiful little matched, matched editions. Introduction. Three epigrams, all from, uh, first two from the Book of the Law, and uh, the next from uh, Equinox Volume 3, number one. For I am divided for love's sake, for the chance of union. This is the creation of the world, that the pain of division is as nothing, and the joy of disillusion all. That's the book of the law, chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. Also, take your fill and will of love as ye will, when, where, and with whom ye will, but always unto me. And that's from the book of the law, chapter 1, verse 51. When you've proved that God is merely a name for the sex instinct, it appears to me not far to the perception that the sex instinct is God. In June of 1912, a 34-year-old Aleister Crowley received a strange and colorful visitor to his London flat at 124 Victoria Street. A mysterious, the mysterious caller was Herr Theodor Reuss, agent of the Prussian Secret Service, Wagnerian opera singer. He actually sang at the opening, at the premiere of uh, Parsifal at Bayreuth. I mean, the guy was really <laughs> Prussian Secret Service and an opera star. He opened opening night of Parsifal at Bayreuth. 
but I digress. He was also a newspaper correspondent and a high degree Freemason and head of Ordo Templi Orientis, a German magical society with Rosicrucian and Masonic pretensions. Two years earlier, Royce had presented Crowley with honorary membership in the OTO, presumably in hopes it would bolster Crowley's esoteric credentials in a lawsuit that had been filed against him by S. L. McGregor Mathers, the head of the London-based Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Mathers had sued to prevent Crowley from publishing proprietary initiation rituals and teachings of the Golden Dawn in his publication, The Equinox. In the suit, Mathers was claiming to be the worldwide head of the, quote, Rosicrucians, an act of spiritual presumption which outraged Royce and the leaders of a score of other existing European Hermetic and Rosicrucian societies. In an attempt to dilute Mather's credentials in the eyes of the court, these organizations lavished a host of honorary degrees and titles upon Crowley so many that he completely lost track of his various memberships, degrees, and mystic titles. Crowley eventually won the suit and published the Equinox. The purpose of the June 1912 visit from Royce, however, was not to discuss the lawsuit of the Golden Dawn matters, but to take Crowley to task for publishing the OTO's supreme secret of sexual magic. Crowley protested that he'd done no such thing, that in fact he hadn't even, he didn't even know the secret and was completely unaware that the OTO had anything to do with sex magic. Royce stepped to Crowley's own bookshelf and plucked out a copy of Lieber 333, the Book of Lies, and opened it to chapter 36, The Star Sapphire, a short version of the hexagram ritual. Crowley did not immediately understand exactly how the contents of this tiny chapter could possibly reveal the supreme secret of sexual magic. So Royce patently discussed, or excuse me, so Royce patiently discussed what he had written vis-a-vis -vis certain theoretical and aspects of magic. He led the discussion in such a way that Crowley experienced an almost instant epiphany. He was stunned. Since childhood, he had intuited the importance and the potential power of sex. But here, in the most profound and simple terms, was the key. Not only to the mythological symbolism of the ancients, of Christianity and Freemasonry, but theoretically at least, the key to the mysteries of human consciousness and creation itself. Before the afternoon had passed, Royce had conferred upon Crowley and his lover, Layla Waddell, the highest initiatory degree of the OTO, the ninth degree, and obligated them to the discretionary terms of its communication. This oath of secrecy is a somewhat paradoxical obligation. Rather than being an oath not to reveal the secret to the world, it rather, it is rather more a promise to perpetuate the secret, to assure that, it's, that it is protected, preserved, and never profaned, diluted, corrupted, or lost. One doesn't learn a true magical secret like one learns a juicy piece of gossip. 
A true magical secret is a light bulb that goes off over your head when you finally get something. In other words, the ninth degree initiate of the OTO is not obligated to conceal the secret, but on the contrary, obligated to make sure as many worthy individuals as possible discover the secret by discerning it themselves. Crowley took this obligation very seriously. And his writings on this particular subject, as we will see in this Best of the Equinox volume on sex magic, can be very difficult to understand. They are full of strange, sometimes disturbing and confusing symbolic language that Crowley believed clearly revealed everything there was to reveal to anyone ready to have everything revealed to them. I must confess, this is not easy. But it is a magical labor well worth the effort because the reward is nothing less than the Holy Grail itself. After bestowing the ninth degree on Crowley and Layla, Royce authorized Crowley to create and head a British chapter of OTO and directed him to expand and develop the organization's rituals of initiation to a workable and viable magical, a series of uh, workable and viable magical ceremonies. From that moment until the end of his life in 1947, sex magic would be the focus of Aleister Crowley's magical work. Unfortunately, the term sex magic has a somewhat lurid ring to it. It brings to mind visions of costumed orgies and pornographic acts of dramatic depravity. Crowley's outrageous and eccentric lifestyle and reputation did little to assuage public perceptions about the naughtiness of anything he might be involved in. It's true. He enjoyed shocking anyone who is easy to shock. To the disappointment of many would-be magicians, however, sex magic is a demanding physical and meditative yogic discipline of the highest order. The underlying theory of the technique is as challenging to the imagination as the postulates of quantum mechanics. Yet the fundamental key to sex magic is breathtakingly simple and can be summarized in the single word ecstasy. The divine consciousness we all experience whenever we temporarily obliviate our sense of separateness from Godhead in timeless moments of orgasm. In that eternal instant, the self becomes the all. And when we are the all, there is nothing we cannot create. Modern students of Crowley are further challenged by the terminology he was obliged to use to camouflage a direct discussion of the subject. Such obfuscation was necessary not only because of Crowley's OTO obligations, but also because of serious concerns of legality. We must recall that it wasn't so very long ago that one could not legally publish material concerning sexual matters. Even medical journals needed to be very careful about how the subject was approached in print. Ironically, discussions of human blood sacrifice were not taboo subjects to write about. Crowley was fiendishly delighted to play this game of words with the publishing world and the public. Not to be dissuaded, he simply drew upon his mastery of language and his knowledge of the colorful metaphors of magic 
to be as shockingly explicit as he wanted. He sometimes unwisely assumed any moderately intelligent person would know what he was really saying. Orgasm and ecstasy he could refer to as death and sacrifice. Sexual fluids, sacred elements used as uh, Eucharistic talismans in India and the East for millennia, became blood and water or the elixir. The penis became the lance or the wand or the rood or the cross, the vagina, the cup or the grail or the rose, etc. In magic and theory and practice, Crowley confesses exactly what kind of game he is playing. In chapter 12 of the chapter called The Bloody Sacrifice and Matters Cognate, he writes, you are likely to get into trouble over this chapter <laughs> unless you truly comprehend its meaning. He also began a footnote to the above statement by warning the reader, get this, there's a traditional saying that whenever an adept seems to have made a straightforward, comprehensible statement, then it is most certain that he means something entirely different. The truth is nevertheless clearly set forth in his words. It is his simplicity that baffles the unworthy. I've chosen the expressions in this chapter in such a way that it is likely to mislead those magicians who would allow selfish interests to cloud their intelligence, but to give useful hints to such as are bound by their proper oaths to devote themselves to the powers uh, 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 devote their powers to legitimate ends. Okay. Uh, and that's where we'll, we'll stop today. The introduction then goes on to t talk uh, a bit more specifically about the Gnostic Mass and uh, the other uh, uh, Crowley rituals of, uh, that have direct relationship to sex magic. But that is something that uh, I hope you will read for yourself in the Best of the Equinox series. But anyway, that's it for Monday. Tomorrow will be a parking lot day, so I'll have to figure out something portable to share with you tomorrow. So until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.